Welcome to the CBS Radio Mystery Theater Archives, the only YouTube channel which has the original classic episodes of the CBS Radio Mystery Theater in order with no ads. Thank you for listening, and now, enjoy the show. this mansion of the mysterious and the macabre. This is the story of a search for a wild talent. You will learn all there is to know about wild talents very soon, and you won't like it. In a sense, this is a treasure hunt. But the prize isn't money or jewels or pirate gold. No, nothing like that. And there isn't any ancient treasure map. No, just a very modern telephone directory which a man carries with him in his car as he drives from address to address throughout the city. Mr. Buchanan? Yes? Uh, may I come up, please? Who are you? My name is Davis. John Davis. What do you want? I want to offer you a reward, Mr. Buchanan. Five thousand dollars. What? You heard me. Five thousand dollars. If. If what? Well, why don't you let me come up and tell you? Five grand? Okay, come on up. Our mystery drama, The Boy Wonder, was written especially for the Mystery Theater by Alfred Bester and stars William Redfield and Robert Dryden. It is sponsored in part by Allied Van Lines and Sinoff, the sinus medicines. I'll be back shortly with Act One. The treasure hunter is named Marion Perkins Warbeck. He is an intense young man, afflicted with an education and inspired by a purpose which most people would regard as lunatic. But then they don't know about wild talents. Marion Warbeck has been telling lies about himself and his search all through the city. And he's lying now to Jason Buchanan. Yeah, Uh, it's me, Mr. Buchanan, John Davis, uh, with that reward. Five grand. Right, but I said if. Uh, may I come in? Uh, sure. This way. Thanks. Now, what's all this, anyway? Ah, nice apartment, Mr. Buchanan. Looks lived in. You got a family? Yeah, yeah. Now, about that five grand. Is this some kind of fancy put on? Oh, no, not at all. I'm from the Science Institute. Never heard of it. Well, that's understandable. We're a very quiet organization devoted to research, but we're big, Mr. Buchanan. Yeah. So? What about the five grand reward? Well, we've got a new research program fully funded to uh, check out the flying saucer mystery. Flying saucers? Yes. You've heard of them. Who hasn't, but... Oh, I know, I know. You don't take the report seriously, but we do. Very seriously. You see, we're trying to put together firm reports of flying saucer sightings, and we're offering a $5,000 reward to reliable witnesses who will be willing to come forward and give evidence. You guys must be crazy. No, not at all. Have you ever seen a flying saucer? No. Oh, that's too bad. Anyway, that's a lot of bunk. Flying saucers? Well, you're entitled to your opinion. Have your children ever seen them? Hmm? What? Your children. You do have children, don't you? Yeah, yeah, but they... they... How many? Two. Them flying saucers never... Are either of school age? What? Your children, school. Do they go to school? Yeah, the boy's 28, the girl's 24. They finished school long ago. Oh, I see. Either of them married? Both. Do they have families? What's this got to do with... Just answer the question, Mr. Buchanan. Do you have grandchildren? Yeah, yeah, five. Ah, living in this city? Ah, they didn't like it here, so the families took off. I see. 
too bad. Uh, about them flying saucers, you scientists, doctors, ought to... We are, we are. Thank you very much, Mr. Buchanan. Sorry about that 5,000. Uh, don't bother to see me out. Takes care of Mr. Jason Buchanan. Who's next? Let's see. Let me see. Huh. Here we are. Alfred Buchanan, 776 Post Road. Yes, as listed. Mm-hmm. Who is it? Uh, is Mr. Buchanan in, please? No. Go away. Is this Mrs. Buchanan? Yes. Go away. My name is Cook, Mrs. Buchanan. David Cook. May I come in, please? I don't let strangers in when my husband's away. I'm here about free prizes, Mrs. Buchanan. What? Free? Prizes. For who? You. Uh, From who? Well, if you'll take the chain off and let me in, Mrs. Buchanan, I'll explain. Well, you don't look like a crook. (laughs) I'm not, ma'am, on my honor. I always tell the truth. Come in, Mr... What'd you say your name was? Uh, Cook, David Cook. This way. Thank you. Want some coffee? No, thank you. Sit there. No. What's all this about prizes? Uh, Free prizes? Well, I'm from Worldwide Broadcasters. Never heard of them. Oh, you will, ma'am. You will. We're preparing a list of names for prize competitions. People who would be willing to appear on shows and win prizes. Uh, You know about that, of course. I sure do. Would you be willing? Who wouldn't? Oh, indeed. Yes, who wouldn't? Have you ever won a prize in a contest? No. I never, because I never got a chance. Well, maybe you will now, Mrs. Buchanan. Did your husband... Did my husband what? Ever win a prize. Who, Al? Never. He never got a chance, either. Well, maybe he will, too. And what about your children? Children? Your children. Have they ever won prizes? Ain't got no children. Oh. Nephews named Buchanan? Ain't got no nephews. Just me and Alf and Mr... I forget your name. Wook. D.H. Wook. Thank you very much, Miss Buchanan. You'll be hearing from us. Private Brownstone, very elegant, very posh. This might be the hot lead, right? Well, that will be high class, too. <sighs> yes? Uh, I beg your pardon. Sorry to intrude. Would it be possible to see Mr. Foster Buchanan, please? At this hour? Well, I know it's rather unconventional, but I'm from the Business Safety Council, and I... uh... Are you, indeed? Oh, yes, I am, indeed. And if you'll tell Mr. Buchanan that I won't take more than five minutes... I'm Buchanan. Well, how do you do, sir? My name is Acorn. Roger Acorn. I'm here from the Safety Council. I heard you, Mr. Acorn. Do come in. Thank you, sir. This way, Mr. Acorn. Tonight is servant's night out. So I'm managing myself. Uh Uh-huh. I uh, think we'll be comfortable here. Uh, Can I offer you a brandy and soda? I'm about to begin myself. No, thank you, Mr. Buchanan. You said uh, five minutes. For what? I have great faith in the Business Safety Council. Our bulwark against the inroads of arrogant chicanery. Well, the purpose of this interview is to inquire whether you have ever been defrauded by, in your words, arrogant chicanery. The attempt has been made, Mr... Uh, Acorn. Ronald Acorn. To be sure. Attempts have been made, Mr. Acorn. I have never been victimized. Ah. Your wife? Never. Your children? Uh, You do have children? My son is hardly old enough to qualify as a victim of confidence tricksters. Indeed. Interesting. Well, how old is he, Mr. Buchanan? He's ten years of age. Uh Uh-huh. Well, is it possible that he's been tricked at school? There are crooks who specialize in victimizing children, as we know at the safety council. Not at my son's school. He's well protected from such riffraff. What school is that, sir? Germanson. One of the best. One of the very best. 
Uh, did he ever attend a city public school? Good heavens, never. I see, I see. Any other children, Mr. Buchanan? A daughter, 17. Mm -hmm. At present in Paris, studying at the Sorbonne. Well, thank you, Mr. Buchanan. I think my time's up. Thank you for your cooperation. I'll, I'll see myself out. Enjoy your brandy and soda. Well, who? Who, me? Yeah, you, mister. Oh, could you... I mean, would you mind helping a lady in distress? <laughs> lady in distress? Come on, I haven't used that expression since the Civil oh. War. Oh, honest, mister, I'm, I'm in the craziest kind of jam, and I'm scared. Look, I've got exactly $7.50 on me. You're wasting your time. Oh, listen to Con, mister. Honest, it's a real jam. Well, it better be good. I, I, I was driving home, and I had to stop for a light back there on the corner. See? Yes? Suddenly a guy jumps out at my car. Yes? He yanks open the back door. Yes? Then he slams it and beats it. And that's your jam? No. It's what he left behind. Uh-huh. And what did he leave behind? A gun. A what? I couldn't figure it. So the first thing I did was look in the back to see if he ripped off anything. He didn't. He didn't. All he did was leave a gun. And I don't believe it. The gun. I saw it. I didn't dare touch it. I didn't even go near it. I got out and ran for a cop. Then you come out of that house, so I ran to you. Are you telling the truth? Why would I lie? Am I trying to hit you for anything? No. So come and look for yourself. Maybe you can figure out what I should do. Trouble is the last thing I want. Come on. Well, I still don't believe you, Miss... Uh, Daisy, Mi Daisy Telford. I still don't believe you, Miss Telford, but I'm incredibly curious. My one vice. Would I make up a story for the sake of $7.50? You didn't know how much I had on me. Do you look like you have more? Oh. That hurts. Frankly, no. So trust me a little. Here, this is my car. Go ahead. Look. Uh, you said the back of the car? On the floor. Well, I don't see any gun. On the far side, behind the driver's seat. Oh, my. On the far side, a gun on the floor, she says, dropped by a mysterious stranger. <gasps> Oh. oh, Joe, you didn't have to hit him so hard. He's such a nice guy. Daisy, baby, when Joe Davenport cools him, he cools him for keeps. Okay, let's move it out. Mr. Harrods, wait. Come on, come on, rise and shine. Everybody up. All right, that'll do, Joe. I think he's coming around. You shouldn't have clobbered him so hard. He's such a he's nice... He's all yours, Mr. Harrod. Mr. Warbeck. Oh. Mr. Warbeck, can you hear me? Can you respond? Uh, no. I won't keep you very long. You'll leave laden with apologies. Uh, just as soon as you tell me what kind of crook you are and who's behind you. What? Crook? Who? Mr. Warbeck, please, put yourself together, or Joe will have to resume with his muscle, which can't be very pleasant. I can make it a lot less pleasant, Mr. Harrod. Mr. Warbeck, can you tell me why you, ostensibly a harmless schoolteacher, have suddenly decided to cut yourself in on my Buchanan caper? The trouble with a treasure hunt, even if it's only for a boy wonder with a wild talent is that you may blunder into something totally unexpected. But you don't know about wild talents and their incredible value yet. You'll find out in the second act, which will begin in just a few moments. a treasure hunt which involves people named Buchanan. You're trapped, slugged, and wake up in what appears to be a respectable legal office. A thief type named Joe is slapping you back to consciousness. A pretty girl named Daisy is trying to protect you. A hearty legal type named Herod wants to know all about you and your connection with people named Buchanan. Mr. Warbeck, why have you, ostensibly a harmless schoolteacher, suddenly taken it upon yourself to cut in on my Buchanan caper? 
Come, come, Mr. Warbeck. No stalling, please. Uh, uh. My name's Herod. Walter Herod, attorney at law. I've been going through your wallet. Mm. Your name is Warbeck. Marion Perkin Warbeck. Right? Yeah, that's right. My name's Warbeck, but I never admit the Marion to strangers. Why this interest in the Buchanans? Why yours? I'm asking the questions. Joe's been tailing you. You've seen five Buchanans per night. Thirty so far. What's your angle? You got no right to kidnap me and grill me. Your papers and ID tell me that you're a teacher by profession. Assistant principal of a public school. I thought teachers were supposed to be legitimate. How did you get mixed up in the inheritance caper? Caper? Uh, racket. The inheritance racket. The heirs of Buchanan caper. What are you using? The personal approach? I... I don't know what you're talking about. I honestly don't know. You're stepping on my toes, Warbeck, and I don't buy it. I'm taking 75000 a year out of this caper, and I'm not going to let you cut in. Now, look, I'm an educated man. Mention Galileo or the lesser cavalier poets, and I'm right up there with you. But there are gaps in my education, and this is one of them. I can't handle the situation. Too many unknowns. All right, I'm going to spell it out for you, Warbeck, so we'll know exactly where we stand. And you won't be able to dummy up. Please do. The inheritance racket is an old, long-term con. It operates like so. The story is that James Buchanan... Fifteenth president of the United States? Yes, the same. One. Buchanan was a bachelor. The story is that he died intestate, leaving a fortune for heirs unknown. Thrilling news. Today, at compound interest, that estate is worth hundreds of millions... Understand? So far. Anybody named Buchanan is a sucker for this setup. I send them a letter. Tell them there's a chance that they may be one of the heirs. Uh Uh-huh. And do they want me to investigate and protect their possible share in the estate? Uh Oh? It only costs a small yearly retainer. Most of them buy it. And now you... Wait a minute, wait a minute. Don't belabor the obvious. I can draw a conclusion. You found out I was checking Buchanan families. You think I'm trying to operate the same racket. A a caper? You think I'm trying to cut in. Cut in? Yes, cut in on you? Well, aren't you? Oh. (laughs) Heavenly guardian angel that this should happen to me. Thank you. Thank you. I'll be forever grateful. I think you must have made him a little crazy with that cropper, Joe. Well... Aren't you trying to cut in? (laughs) No. I'm not cutting in on you, Mr. Herod. Look, you will accompany me to my office in the school, and I will show you why I'm interested in the Buchanan. Now, just a minute, Warbeck. I said I'd make it up to you. We'll have to use your car, Miss Telford. Mine's probably been towed away by now. Herod, I'm going into partnership with you three. You've got what I need to locate one particular Buchanan. He's ten years old, and he's worth millions more than your phony... $100 $100 million. Oh, this is my office. Come in. Aren't they going to ask about us being here at night? No, 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 Miss Telford. I often work late. Call this closet an office? Well, they aren't very generous to teachers, Joe. Sit down, everybody, if you can find somewhere. Mm-hmm. And this, Miss Telford and gentlemen, is my buried treasure. You've got a million stashed in that file? No, Mr. Harrod, just a composition. A composition? Worth a million more than your Buchanan fortune. I think this clown is putting us on. Quiet, Joe. We owe him this favor. Go ahead, Mr. Warbeck. Thank you. Now, a school assistant principal has to supervise classes. He reviews work, estimates progress, irons out student problems, and so on. I do this by random samplings. We have 900 pupils in this school. I can't supervise them individually. Is he supposed to be saying something? He is, Joe. Just listen. I'm waiting for the money talk. Here it is, Joe. Looking through some fifth grade work last month, I came across this fantastic composition. It was written by Stuart Buchanan of the fifth grade. His age must be ten or thereabouts. Now, the composition is entitled My Vacation. I'll read it to you 
and you'll understand why Stuart Buchanan must be found. This is the money? Yes, Joe, this is the money. Uh, my Vacation by Stuart Buchanan. This summer, I visited my friends. I have four friends, and they're very nice. First, there is Tommy, who lives in the country, and he is an astronomer. Tommy built his own telescope out of glass six inches across, which he ground himself. He looks at the stars every night, and he lets me look even when it is raining cats and dogs. Wait a minute, Warbeck, are you putting us on? Patience. Patience. Now, let's see. <clears throat> Cats and dogs. We could see the stars because Tommy made a thing for over the end of the telescope which shoots up like a searchlight and makes a hole in the sky to see right through the rain and everything to the stars. Well, Mr. Herod, what do you think of Tommy, the astronomer? I don't understand this at all. It couldn't be simpler. Tommy gets bored waiting for clear nights. He invented something that cuts through clouds, a funnel of vacuum so he can use his telescope in all weather. And what it amounts to is a disintegration beam. The hell you say? The hell I don't. Next friend of Stewart's, and I quote. Then I went to Anne Mary and stayed one whole week. It was fun, because Anne Mary has a spinach changer for spinach and beets and string beans. But the devil is a spinach changer. Spinach. Spinach changer. Spelling isn't one of Stewart's talents. Uh, where was I? Oh, yes, here. When her mother made us eat them, Anne Mary pressed the button, and they stayed the same outside, only inside they became cake, cherry and strawberry. I asked Anne Mary how, and she said it was by Enhev. You've lost me. Simple. Anne Mary doesn't like vegetables. So, she's just as smart as Tommy, the astronomer. She's invented a matter transmuter. She transmutes spinach into cake, cherry or strawberry. Cake she eats with pleasure. So does Stuart. And you're crazy, Warbeck. Uh uh, not me. The kids. They're geniuses. There's only one label for them they're wild talents. Wild talent? What's wild talent? Later. Let's finish up with Lazy Ethel. I continue to read Stuart's composition. <clears throat> My friend George has a sister, Ethel, who is the laziest girl I ever saw. She is big and fat and hates to walk. So when her mother sends her to the store, Ethel thinks to the store and thinks home with all the packages and has to hang around George's room hiding until it will look like she walked both ways. George and I make fun of her because she is fat and lazy, but she gets into movies for free. The end. I don't believe it. I don't believe it. Uh-huh great little girl, Ethel. She's too lazy to walk, so she teleports. Then she has to hide with her packages while George and Stuart make fun of her. Teleport? That's right, Miss Telford. She moves from place to place by thinking her way there. Oh. There ain't no such thing. There wasn't until Lazy Ethel came along. There wasn't any disintegration beam until Tommy the astronomer invented one. And Anne Mary invented a matter transmuter because she doesn't like spinach. That, friends is wild talent. Children accomplishing incredible things for childish reasons. I still don't believe it. That kid's got a wild imagination, that's all. Mm -hmm. Possibly. You just give me five minutes with this Stuart Buchanan. I'm a lawyer and I'll find out. I had the same idea myself. I'm a teacher and I can find out, but I can't. Why not? Because Stuart Buchanan's done the impossible. He's disappeared. Lock, stock, and barrel. Gone without a trace. He can't be found. Well, which proves he was lying. You caught him in the lie and he ran. You still think this was just his imagination, Mr. Herod? Well, what else? I'll tell you what else. It's in that part about Anne Mary. Where is it? It's the one who doesn't like spinach. That's the one, Miss Telford. Yeah. Ah, here. Now, quote. Anne Mary pressed the button and they stayed the same outside, only inside they became cake, cherry and strawberry. I asked Anne Mary how, and she said it was by Enhev, end quote. That's E-N-H-V. So, that's a kid's gibberish word. Mm -mm. No, Herod. That's how Anne Mary transmuted manner. Well, with a kook word like a, a enver? Come on. No, no. Not enver, Joe. It took time, but I figured it out. That's Planck's quantum equation. E equals NHV. One of the most abstruse concepts in theoretical physics. Well, Herod? A kid invented that, too. There's coincidence. Does that sound likely? Well, then he read it somewhere. Ten-year-old reading quantum mechanics? Nonsense. Oh, damn it, you let me at that kid for five minutes. Me too, let... but he's disappeared. 
That's why I've been checking every Buchanan in the phone book, trying to locate him. The day I read this composition and sent down for Stewart to have a talk with him, he disappeared into thin air and hasn't been seen since. Well, what about his family? <sighs> the trouble disappeared, too. What's more, every record of their location had disappeared. A few people remember them vaguely, but that's all. They split, huh? Oh, the very word, Joe. Thank you. Well, what a situation. Here's a child who makes friends with child geniuses. They're making fantastic discoveries for childish purposes. Who knows? Maybe Stewart's got other friends with wilder talents. Is this Stewart a wild talent, too? Probably. Kids generally hang out with their peer group that shares the same interests and talents. And what kind of genius is he? I don't know. A genius for disappearing, maybe. He blabbed like a child in his composition. When I sent for him, he got scared like a child, ran away, and covered his tracks. How did he get into the school files? I don't know. All I know is he destroyed anything that might lead to him. Stuart has run away, and we have got to find him. Just to find out, is he smart? No, Miss Telford, to find his friends. He's the only lead. Surely I don't have to explain. What would the Pentagon pay for a disintegration beam? How many millions would an element transmuter be worth? If we could teleport, travel by mind alone, how powerful would we be? My goodness. Mr. Herod, this professor's almost got me convinced. How about you? Mr. Warwick, your caper makes us look like pikers. Thanks for letting us cut in on you. We'll pay off. We'll find that kid. It's been suggested that children are really alien creatures, thinking their own strange thoughts to themselves and performing incomprehensible alien acts in their own private world, which no grown-up is ever permitted to enter. Is Stuart Buchanan a doorway to this alien world? And if he's found, what will his world be like? Act three will tell us in just a few moments. Are Stuart Buchanan's friends working miracles with their wild talents? Discovering disintegration beams, matter transmuters, teleportation? If not, does he have a wild imagination? And if he merely imagined all this, why and how has he disappeared without a trace? The only answer is to find Stuart Buchanan and question him. Walter Herod, attorney at law, is explaining to the boy's teacher how this can be done. It's not possible for anyone to vanish without a trace, Warbeck. Even a genius with a wild talent for crime? You've been blundering around chasing after Buchanan's in the phone book. There are other angles. You don't run after a missing person. You look around on his back trail for something he'd drop. Mm -mm. A genius wouldn't drop anything. All right, let's grant the kid's a genius, but a kid's a kid. He must have overlooked something. He forgot about that composition. And we'll find that something. Now, where's that school of yours located? Jefferson Park. Any busing? No. Then it's a neighborhood school. The kid's family must have lived around there. Let's go. Over there, Professor. The 800 block. Stop. Oh, what's this address? Jefferson Park Post Office substation. You move out of a neighborhood, you file a change of address card with your post office. Now, wait. Well? No. And what's this? Election board. All voters are registered. If a voter moves from one election district to another... Provision is usually made that a record of the transfer be kept. Ah, clever. Stewart could hardly think of that. No, I'm hoping. Wait for me. Well? No. Now what? Gas and electric company. 
All subscribers must transfer their accounts if they move. If they move out of town, they usually ask for their deposit back. There are records. If Stuart Buchanan can break into Consolidated and destroy their records, he's a better man than I am. We'll see. Wait. Don't tell me he's a better man than I am. Yes. All right, let's go. Motor Bureau. No, huh? No. All right, let's, uh, let's go back to my office. I can't stand any more disappointments. Hi, Mr. Harris. Hi, Professor. Any luck? No. You? Well, maybe yes, maybe no. Please, don't be mysterious, Joe. I'm not. I'm spooky. What about? Well... Me and Daisy and Charlie the Clown been covering the Jefferson Park name. What? You let Charlie in on this caper? No, no. Just brought him along for window dressing. He gets along great with kids. Yes, and? Idea was to locate one of this Stewart's little pals and find out where the kid went. Well, did you? Nah. But Charlie located the block where the Stewart kid used to live. Good. Daisy took off to find out what real estate company handles the block. Huh, that was smart. And Charlie the Clown took a powder. He what? Disappeared. One minute he was with me, the next he was gone. Did you see him go? No. He was walking behind me. When I turned around to tell him something, he just wasn't there. Holy saints, what have we got ourselves into? You, uh, you think Stuart Buchanan had something to do with his disappearance? What else can I think? Well, there's got to be some rational explanation. We're going up to the Jefferson neighborhood, Joe, and look for Charlie. Warbeck, stay here and mind the store. Office of Walter Herod, attorney at law. Oh, this isn't Mr. Herod. Uh, Miss Telford? Yes, you must be the professor. <laughs> In person. Could you put Mr. Herod on? Not here. Then Joe Davenport. Same answer. They both left to do some looking. For, I shouldn't say it on the phone. For you know who? Yes. Well, I did some finding. Not you know who. No, but close. I've got him here. Got who, Daisy? The manager of the R.G. Realty Company. He was in charge of the building where you know who used to live. Daisy, you're a marvel. Bring him up to the office right away. I can't. He hasn't got time. That's all right. That's all right. Then I'll come to him. Where are you now? The Bristol Cafe. Third booth from the back. You'll recognize me by my black coffee without sugar. Oh, I got here as fast as I could. Uh, where's the manager of R.G. Realty? Couldn't he wait? Oh, he's still here at the bar. What did you get from him so far? Well, he doesn't remember the family much. Kind of vague, you know? Yes. He remembers the family signed a lease for a four-room apartment in the Jefferson Lawn. Uh-huh. Did he show you the lease? He couldn't. Why not? It wasn't in the files. It was gone. Oh, I might have known. Every about the family was gone. We've been wondering what kind of wild talent Stuart Buchanan has. Maybe the boy is a thief genius. How does he get at every trace, every record, and destroy it? Now, what's taking R.G. Realty so long at that bar for? Are you sure he didn't take a powder? Run out on you? No. His hat and coat are hanging right here. He must be at the bar. In a check jacket. Oh. I don't see any check jacket. Do you? No. Three men there and nobody checked. Daisy, I'm afraid we've lost another. Oh. I think he's knocking us off one by one. All right, Warbeck, cool it. So the kids licked us straight down the line. Well, I've got a gimmick. They lived in Jefferson Arms. Look up the house phone number in the book. I know it. There was a Buchanan listed at that address, and I checked them. Well? Moved out. Gone. The janitor told me. Great. 
That's our solid lead. Call the janitor. Well, he told me everything he knew, and it was nothing. Buchanan's lived there, left, period. <sighs> Hello? Oh, Mr. Rysdale, I'm that teacher, Mr. Warbeck, who talked to you before about... <laughs> yes, yes, that's right. Well, I've got a friend here who wants to ask you something else. Here you are, Herod. <laughs> now, hello. Yeah, well, listen, sir. Uh, when anybody moves in or out of a building, the janitor... Oh, excuse me, the super... Uh, takes down the name of the movers in case they damage the building. Well, yes, I'm a lawyer. I know this. It's to protect the building in case an action has to be brought, right? Yes, that's right. Now, who moved the Buchanans out? Yes, yes, I'll wait. Yes? Oh, thanks. We've got it made. Made, made. The Avon Moving Company, truck number G4. Now, this is why you're here, Daisy. Warbeck and I couldn't get anything from the Avon Movers. They had no record of moving the Buchanan family. Well, the kid was pretty thorough. I'm dying to meet him. But they did have a record of the men who worked truck G4 that day. We contacted one of them, and he's going to meet us here in this bar after he quits. What for? To tell us everything he can remember about the job. Including where he moved the Buchanans to. So why me? You want I should ask him something? No, 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 Daisy. I want you should soften him up. You know, oh. ask him. Here, hold it, hold it. This must be the guy. Oh, oh good evening, uh, Mr. Moore. It is Mr. Moore? Yeah, Patty Moore. Are you the lawyer guy? Uh, yes, uh, Herod. Uh, I've been thinking about what you asked me on the phone. And I asked the rest of the crew... All we can remember about that Jefferson Park job is that it was an all-day proposition. Why all day? Because it took us all the way to Helen Gone from Jefferson Park. Where to? Old Town Suburb. Old Town? Uh, what street in Old Town, Mr. Moore? Uh, ma Maple something. Uh, uh, yeah, uh, Maple Road. Uh, what number? Uh, this, I, I can't, I couldn't remember. Uh, that kid again. Well, we know the street, and I think Daisy may be able to coax Moore into remembering the number. Daisy, love, why don't you and your friend Patty Moore... Daisy? Daisy? Where'd she go? Well, she, she was right there. She just up and gone. Just like that. Gone. <laughs> You got that old town street map, Joe? Right here. Uh -huh. There's Maple Row. Uh, Twelve blocks long. See? All right. Twelve blocks, four apiece. We cover every house and every apartment. Now, we've got to be careful. It looks like any time anybody threatens to get close to the kid, he wipes them out. Yes? No argument here. All right. So we drive out to Old Town Park... Start the screening operation, but we meet at the car every half hour and check in, right? It'll take forever. There's a million kids per square inch in Old Town. There's a million dollars a day in it for us if we find him. Now, let's move it. Professor? Present and accounted for, thank heavens. All right, where's Joe? Coming, coming. <sighs> I got mixed up in a stickball game. Did you case the kids playing in the street, Professor? I looked them over. No Stuart Buchanan. And we don't know whether the kids playing on Maple Row live on Maple Row, so we stick to the apartment search. Any lead so far, Joe? Nope. Professor? Negative. Nothing in mind yet. All right. Let's keep trying. Professor? Not yet. You? No. Where's Joe? <laughs> Last time I saw him, he was down the street trying to sidestep a potsy game. Only girls play potsy. Only girls. No Stuart Buchanan. Where the devil is Joe? Is he always on time? Always. Well, maybe he got a hot lead. You believe that? I want to believe it. What do you really believe? That Joe got too close. And the kid got it. But how? 
Same way he got Charlie the Clown and that manager and Daisy. Maybe Joe got scared and quit. No, not on a million dollars. Herod, how does a kid do it? I'm scared. So am I. You want to quit now? We can't. If the boy's that dangerous, we've got to find him. Oh, we know what to do. We both covered Joe's sector. I'll take the right side of Maple Row, you take the left. We meet here every half hour. And we'll be strictly on time. If Stuart Buchanan lets us. And if one of us is late, honk the horn as a reminder. Make it too long, one short. Got that? Let's go. Something silly like the others. A special light, maybe, that murders people. Wipes them out like Daisy and... Oh, what is going to happen when Stuart Buchanan grows up? What's going to happen when the rest of them grow up? He's somewhere in Herod's sector. Right side of Maple Row. This block. Destroying us one by one. Smiling to himself. A vicious, killing genius. Stuart! Stuart Buchanan? Can you hear me? I'm here, Stuart, waiting for you. Stuart? 85? 90? 95? 100? Anybody round my base is it? Stuart Buchanan! Come out! Come out! Wherever you... Stuart Buchanan, come out, come out, wherever you are. Where is he? In an alley behind Maple Row, deeply involved in a game of hide-and-seek, aged ten, wearing sweater, jeans, and sneakers, hiding behind ash cans, determined not to be caught. He looks up at the sunset sky and sees the evening star and whispers, Starlight, star bright, first star I see tonight. Wish I may, wish I might. Grant me the wish I wish tonight. I wish that anybody who tries to bother me would go away forever. I'll be back shortly. Buchanan is unaware that he has disposed of Warbeck, Herod, Joe, Daisy, and scores of others who disappeared forever. That he has forced his parents to move from Jefferson Park. That he has wiped out almost every trace of himself in his innocent desire to be left alone and happy. He is unaware that he is a genius with a wild talent. The power of this boy wonder is for wishing and making his wishes come true. And I sincerely hope that none of you has a wild talent in your family. Our cast included William Redfield, Robert Dryden, Ken Harvey, Martha Greenhouse, and Dan Arco. The entire production was under the direction of Hyman Brown. <laughs> A preview of our next tale. I would possess her soul with patience. She's mine. She, she's all yours. 19th Precinct, Sergeant Sloan. Uh, Sergeant, uh, I hope it's a false alarm, but I happen to pass my uh, 221 Collier Place, and uh, I'm, I'm sure I heard a woman screaming. You know, as if she was being murdered or something. But I... I didn't do it, officer. I didn't do it. 
You'll have to come along with us, Mr. Mason. But she was dead. She was already dead when I got here. Sergeant, you have to believe me. It uh, doesn't matter if I believe you or not, Mr. Mason. Your problem is going to be with a judge and a jury. Radio Mystery Theater was sponsored in part by Buick Motor Division. This is E.G. Marshall inviting you to return to our mystery theater for another adventure in the macabre. Until next time, pleasant dreams.